Hare Krishna devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. We welcome devotees again to our morning Bhavdan class. Uh, this morning, it's extra special because one, it's, it's the morning of New Year's Eve. And two is we are, we are starting embarking the, the New Year's with New Year's Eve with, uh, by hearing from His Holiness Chandramali Swami. So Mars, thank you so much for joining us. We are ever excited to hear from you on this wonderful day. So it's all yours, Maharaj. Okay. Kumagyanti mirandasya gena jana salakaya chaksu un militam yena tasmai shri gurvena maha nama om vishnu padaya krishna prestaya bhutale shimati bhakti viranta swami iti namane namaste saraswati devi gauravani pacharine nirase sa sunyavadi pastyatya de sintarine Panchakalpa, Tarubhischa, Kripa Sindhu, Bebhacha, Patita, Dham, Bhavane, Vyo, Vaishnave, Vyo, Namaho, Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Bhavunityananda, Sri Advaita Gadad, Har, Sri Vansali, Gaur, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Panchakalpa, Tarubhischa, Kripa Sindhu, Devacha Patitanam Pavani Vyo Vaishnavi Vyo Namaha. So here we have a verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto, third chapter, number 32. So I'll read the Sanskrit and the translation, and maybe someone from the audience, maybe Mataji Manasuya, can read the purport. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Atapuram Yaravyaktam. Ayudyam Guna Brimhitam. Adrishta Shruta Vastuvat. Sajivo Yat Purnam Bhavaha. Translation. Let me see here, okay. Beyond this gross conception of form is another subtle conception of form of which is without formal shape and is unseen, unheard, and unmanifest. The living being has his form beyond this subtlety, otherwise he could not have repeated births and death. I can yeah. read the purport, Maharaj. Okay. By His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta, Swami Shri Prabhupada, Ki Jai. As the gross cosmic manifestation is conceived as the gigantic body of the Lord, so also there is the conception of His subtle form, which is simply realized without being seen, heard, or manifested. But in fact, all these gross or subtle conceptions of the body are in relation with the living beings. The living being has his spiritual form beyond this gross material or subtle psychic existence. The gross body and psychic functions cease to act as soon as the living being leaves the visible gross body. In fact, we say that the living being has gone away because he's unseen and unheard. Even when the gross body is not acting, when the living being is in sound sleep, we know that he is within the body by his breathing. So the living beings passing away from the body does not mean that there is no existence of the living soul. It is there. Otherwise, how can he repeat his births again and again? The conclusion is that the Lord is eternally existent in his transcendental form, which is neither gross nor subtle like that of the living being. His body is never to be compared to the gross and subtle bodies of the living being. All such conceptions of God's body are imaginary. The living being has his eternal spiritual form, which is conditioned only by his material contamination. Om Gyan. Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvasis Nasunyavadi Pastyatya Deyasitarine. So this purport 
seems to be going back and forth between the Lord, its body, and the living entity. Here, the previous verses are talking about the cosmic manifestation of the gigantic universal body, which, as is explained in previous verses, is simply imaginary, but it's meant for those who cannot uh, worship the Lord in his transcendental form. You, you want to keep the verse up? Yeah, that would be good. Okay, uh, I need to look at the purport a little bit as we go on here. Yeah, so uh, as, uh, we, as we are able to worship the Lord in his transcendental form as Krishna or any of the manifestations that are emanations from Krishna, there is another form for those who are grossly material, and that's the universal imaginary body of the Lord, which compares the different places within the universe to the different parts of the Lord's transcendental body. Here it talks about the living entity who is different than a gross and subtle body. <clears throat> a lot of times people, even devotees, may make the mistake that thinking, well, I'm not my physical body, but we identify ourselves too much with the mind. And I, as I think I am, but this is also another form of existence that is separate from our actual existence. It's the subtle form or what is called the mental body. But within the mental body is the actual person, the soul. And, uh, the soul ca is carried from one body to another, life after life, by the mental body, which consists also of the intelligence and false ego. We know that as reincarnation, or a better way to say it is a transmigration of the soul from one body to another. But we, just like we have a physical body with a particular form, we have a, we have a spiritual body. Also, the Lord also has a spiritual body where he doesn't have a difference between his gross and subtle conceptions. His body is him on, on all levels. He is pure spiritual energy and his body is of the same nature. <clears throat> and uh, so there is no distinction between the Lord and his body, but the living entities coming to the material world, we accept them a body which is somewhat uh, different than ourselves, not somewhat, but completely different than ourselves, made up the, of the energy of this world. So these eight elements, so Krishna speaks these things as his separated energy, <clears throat> but there's another Jiva Jiva Bhuta Mahabhavo Eye Dhamma Jayate Jagat. Beyond that, or within that, is the actual living being. And the living being also has a form, but that form is not uh, visible or understood while one is still encased in the material ta tabernacle. That spiritual form comes when the living entity realizes himself different from his body and acts according to that body. Then the body actually manifests. So the, the living being is, is traveling within one body after another as a particle of spiritual energy, which encased in that particle is actually our, our form, not in case, but it's uh, as Prabhupada has said, it's crunched up. <laughs> it's, it's packed up, just like you take a box and you want to send some goods to a different location. You might pack it all up with, with uh, all kinds of, uh, you know, what they call it, I don't know, stuff for insulation and packing. You put all kinds of paper around it. And if it's very fragile, you mark on the box and you also pack it really tight. And there may not be much uh, room for the 
for the actual item and most of it's packing. So we're packed up in this material bond by the in our size of our existence, as it says, in this body is one ten thousand the tip of a hair. So no one can measure that. It's immeasurable. It's so small. But that is the actual statement given by the Upanishads that the soul is that that tiny. But when it actually reaches realization outside of the body and attains to the spiritual realm, it assumes its natural body, which is one of the different bodies that are there within the spiritual existence. These are either as some feature of material uh, spiritual existence, such as trees or rocks or plants or water, animals, or it could be in the form of a, um, a, uh, a cowherd boy. It could be in the form of a parent to Krishna or one on the conjugal level. Different, le different types of bodies that are innate within our existence, but packed up by our material existence, our material, uh, we say prison. It's more like a prison being in this body is analogous to be living inside of a prison. You know, prison means restrictions, prison means punishment. So this body is always punishing the soul in different ways and causing the soul great distress because it goes through various types of sufferings. And the living entity, the soul within the body has a tendency to identify with that. So although the soul is not suffering, the soul thinks it's suffering. Just like when you're in a dream, you may experience some kind of suffering in the dream, but it's not really happening. But while you're in the dream, you're experiencing that the pain of that, uh, that experience. So in the same way, in this body, we are experiencing this pain of material existence Although we're not actually experiencing it, we think we are. And to get out of that consciousness means to understand and realize, not only understand, but realize the difference between you and the body that you inhabit. And so, yeah, being in this situation is like, and there's no freedom. Uh, what is our freedom? And of course, we not only are not, we are not free within the body, but the material energy is also pushing the living entity in different ways. And then the social pressure, political pressure, economic pressures, so many things restrict the living entity's natural freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom of creativity, freedom of love, freedom of happiness, all these things, freedom of knowledge. All these things are, are wound down into the smallest tiny uh, element within this material body. So the idea is to get out of this material body and go back to the spiritual world. But um, we have to continue to transmigrate from one body to another, life after life. Mitche Maya Davase. Kachu Beshe, Kachu Habu Bubai, Jeep Krishna Das, E Vishwash, Kolida Adukanai, Bhakti Vinota Kor sings that just like a uh, piece of straw on, a, on an ocean <clears throat> gets thrown from one place to another by the movement of the ocean waves. Similarly, by the movement of the three modes of material energy, this, the living entity gets thrown from one material existence to another. Karanam Guna Sango shows Sarasa Joni Janmasu, <clears throat> sometimes in a good situation in the higher planets, where one feels material happiness in the body of a demigod or demigoddess, or <clears throat> in the material energy as such as this middle planet, where there is a mixture of happiness and this distress, but mostly it's characterized by lamentation and illusion. And then of course, the lower species of life, the animals, they're characterized by misery and a lot of fear. So this is the 
where we say the fate of the living entity in the material world. And we can't get out of this cycle unless we actually develop pure love for Krishna. So developing pure love for Krishna, there's one thing that helps us to achieve that, and that is having that as a goal in life. That has to be our goal. If we don't make it a goal, it won't happen automatically. We might say, well, whatever happens, then I'll accept. No, you have to actually live according to your desire. Our desire is to go back home, back to Godhead and experience eternal love with Krishna in so many different uh, ways. And, but that has to be what is called a vow or a focus. I want to develop pure love for God and I want to go back home, back to Godhead. And then <clears throat> once you start focusing like that, then you start understanding how to achieve that. Without that focus, the achievement may also be somewhat sporadic or less, less focus on the actual goal. So that can be done at any time. So now we have this uh, year is ending. This is the last day of the year. For some people, they think this year was the worst ever and others think it was the greatest ever. Some people have a mixture of both. That's the way the world is. According to your situation, you have your experience according to what's happening on the external world. For the devotees, it was kind of a mixture of both. It caused some limitations and it caused radical changes in the way we lived and the way we interacted with others. And on another level, it increased our ability to preach <clears throat> and to engage in what we say more internal devotional service such as chanting, reading, and uh, maybe if we living with devotees, we, we develop better relationships, we have more time to develop those relationships. For the materialists, it's the worst possible year in the world. <clears throat> Not only are they are restricted, but their fear has risen to such a height that <clears throat> They are more or less imprisoned by their own fear and can hardly function and are waiting for some change. And in the meantime, either they're depressed or they're trying to counteract their depression by more forms of uh, sense gratification. Whatever they were doing for sense gratification, they might think, well, I just need to increase it now because there's no other alternative in this miserable situation. <clears throat> and so this is the way of material life. For something, for somebody, it's wonderful when something happens. And sometimes the same thing happens and is miserable. I had a personal experience of that in a very big way <clears throat> when I was in Denver, Colorado in the year 2006, I believe it was. I was. It was the winter of 2006, and it was exactly the same time. It was right around Christmas, right after Christmas. And <clears throat> I had been scheduled to leave Denver and go to a place I had never been before for preaching. <clears throat> and uh, I was waiting for the time to leave, but then a huge snowstorm came and just buried the city, <clears throat> really buried it, where all flights were stopped in and out, all schools and many businesses were closed, and uh, consequently millions of dollars were lost in equity and in, you know, just keeping things going. But on another level, <clears throat> there was a, uh, there was a happiness in the, and the slopes, because Denver and all around Colorado, they have a lot of ski slopes. So the skiers were thinking, wow, this is really good. We're getting some real nice slow, packing down the, the ski slopes. This will make our skiing even more wonderful. So those who own the ski slopes, they were also dancing in ecstasy. Customers were coming. So you can see how material energy works for some people. 
it's the same thing as miserable and for another person the same thing is a source of happiness and <clears throat> so devotees can reflect on this particular year and see now we have we can move into the next year well, which way are we going to direct our life are we going to go on in the same way or are we going to somehow or other make certain uh, determined vows to fulfill certain desires or are we going to actually try to fulfill our real desire and that is to develop pure love of God so if we do that then gradually and what we say by the mercy of the Lord because when the Lord sees the, the, the desire of the devotee and the activities that are connected with that desire he helps and his helping is a big part of our success. In fact, it, it's the final principle of success or the complete principle of success. So devotees should make this year that I'm going to use my time to hear and chant the glories of the Lord more. I'm going to chant more and better rounds. I'm going to... Uh, Take more opportunities to try to give Krishna consciousness to others. If you make these three focuses and you arrange your life in such a way as to do that, you'll see that whatever problems you have are no longer there anymore. Because Krishna will focus, help you to focus on these three things, to hear and chant more, the glories of the Lord to increase the quality of it and quantity of our chanting and uh, to preach and be an instrument for Lord Chaitanya's mercy for Prabhupada's desire to spread Krishna consciousness everywhere. So um, for a devotee there's an old saying um, that a very good businessman, when the prices go up, he makes a profit. And when the prices go down, he makes a profit. He knows, because he knows business so well, he knows how to adjust according to the change in prices. So that's a devotee. A devotee can use any and every situation as an opportunity to increase their, their love for Krishna and their activities in devotional service. Okay, so I'll stop here. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, such a wonderful message about preparing our minds and how we looked at 2020 and how we should look in 2021. If there are any questions or comments, uh, reflections and realizations we and uh, we request devotees to please uh, do unmute yourself and uh, ask your question I'm looking at the chat I mean not the chat I am um, the participant list that's what I meant to say um, if you don't have your hand raised that's fine you can just jump in and you know unmute yourself and ask questions uh, very nice topic as we prepare for the next year and based on the verse Prakshit has a question, but I don't think I can hear him. Hare Krishna. Oh, there you are. Hare okay. Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, except I'm, you, I'm a you can bring the screen back up if you want to, the normal screen. There. Hare Krishna Maharaj. I can hear you, and I think uh, you can hear me, right? Uh, I can see you, too. Okay, that's, your, that's good. Yeah, I had, I had difficulty getting the, audio, I mean, the video to work. Um, the three aims that you said that you would uh, embark on this 2021 hearing and chanting um, the quality and also increasing the quantity of chanting, preaching and spreading Krishna consciousness everywhere. Wonderful. I, I would definitely love to do the same thing too. So I'm glad you, um, you brought it up. Um, so that's my comment. Um, the increasing the 
quality of chanting. Can you speak a little more about that, the quality? Because our minds tend to roam so much. Yeah, it, well, <clears throat> Prabhupada does emphasize the importance of hearing as the feature for keeping the mind in the back and keeping the sound foremost. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, whenever and wherever the mind goes due to its unsteady and flickering nature, bring it back under the control of the self. So Japa is actually a struggle <coughs> to continue to hear. But if you approach the holy name in the right way, that struggle is mitigated where there is a little effort and a lot of results. And that probably we have to approach the holy name in the mood of, of begging for the holy name and in, in the mood of um, uh, yeah, begging the mercy of the holy name and being, and being desirous to take shelter of Krishna completely to the sound of his holy name. And praying for the Lord to come. Um, there's different ways we can, what we say, access uh, different techniques which will help to bring about greater amount of attention. But all these techniques are subservient or secondary to our the mood of devotion that we bring with us when we begin our chanting. That mood is important. Uh, one of the moods that we should think is that <clears throat> japa is something I look forward to. <clears throat> Excuse me. We should, there's a nice saying that was done by my god brother Mahatma in his little book called Japa Affirmations. He says, I, I want to chant. No, I, I get to chant. I want to chant. I love to chant. Chanting is a privilege. Chanting is something I want to do. Something It's something that I is the most important part of my day, and I look forward to it. If we have this mood like, oh no, here it is again, 16 rounds. Um, I got a backpack on and it's heavy and I'm climbing Ke Mount Kilimanjaro. Then it'll be like that. <laughs> but if you look forward to it and realize it's, it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to associate with Krishna through his holy name. So our attitude that we take within Japa is a big part of the quality of our Japa. And we should never be in a hurry to finish. This is one of the things that uh, devotees have a tendency. They, they get a little impetuous that they want to finish their rounds. So within that mood, if you want to finish your rounds, you have a tendency not to hear properly. Or you have a tendency to go faster than the mind is able to hear. So get rid of that. Don't play beat the clock japa. That's that's one of the worst forms of destroying your japa. Allow yourself enough time to chant, and if you don't have it, just section out your chanting according to your to the allotted time you have. Don't rush. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Again, I'm having and, video issues, so I'm yeah, hearing you. And, and for added for added information, you can read Sachinanda Maharaj's book, The Living Name. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Are there any uh, other questions um, from other devotees who would like to ask? Um, and I'm sure it can be on any topic, and Marge will definitely answer. Um, 
looking down the list. Oh, wait, what do I, uh, Vivek Prabhu? Yes, Prabhu, please unmute yourself and ask a your question, Prabhu. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to you Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, I have two questions. Uh, one, like for us, uh, New Year is actually starts from tomorrow or like actually it starts from uh, Gaur Purnima? Uh, for us, for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas, it's Gaur Purnima. For people in India, traditionally, it's Vasant Panchami. Uh, for the secular world outside, it's tomorrow. Okay. For some people, there's another day, there's one more day somewhere in there. I can't. But I know Vasant Panchami for the traditional Indians, they, they do it by the uh, beginning of the because in India, there are 10, there are six seasons, not four. Mm -hmm. okay. But people follow the Judeo Krishna, Judeo Christian calendar and see it as tomorrow, the new year. That has become the norm, but for, for Vaishnavas, it's Gaur Purnima. For Gaudiya Vaishnavas, it's Gaur Purnima. For some Vaishnavas, it's John Mastami. <laughs> Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Maharaj, my uh, other question is, uh, normally, actually, I try to teach my mind that you should not ask for any material things from Krishna. Yeah, as you were discussing yesterday as well as last week and today also like how to teach mind. But when actually odd situation comes, then uh, like I share my challenge with Krishna like as he is our eternal father, mother. So whatever good or bad coming, just try to share with him. And uh, in that mood, again, like it happens that I ask for his support, his like like this material things are happening like this way. I really need your help also to come out of this. So my sadhana is not impacted. Is that okay, Maharaj, in that way or should not be think at all like, like at least aspire for not like thinking that mode? Yeah, you, you can't approach the holy name and especially the Lord in any sense for anything material. That's the... That completely defeats the whole idea of chanting. That is that is strongly restricted. So this, if you want to approach the Holy the the Lord for something material, um, it says that you are your intelligence is not so good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the most direct statement, because the Lord knows exactly what you need. And for those who surrender him and to him in devotion, he'll take care of everything, don't worry. And sometimes he, he gives material benefits just to make his devotee happy. But he doesn't do it if it's going to interfere with our spiritual advancement so that's that that we want to re avoid 100 percent did thank that you help? Maharaj. i'm sorry thank you, yeah. thank you very much thank you very much yeah it okay. definitely helps I don't think you're so happy with my answer, right? No, <laughs> so Guru, like, actually, like, what happens, like, in mind, uh, like, Krishna is kind of everything, yeah, like, in terms of, and, uh, like, whether father, mother, whenever, like, good things comes, like, try to share with him that, okay, something good has happened, something bad is happening, then also, like, try to share, and then feel, I ask his support that, please help me to come out of this situation. 
and that's the kind yeah. of mood but uh, for krishna there's no such thing as good and bad <laughs> materially you know, he sees everything in one in the same way he does we make these distinctions between good and bad these and lord chaitanya has spoken this whole thing what is it what is that Badra Badra Sakale Saman A Wanda A Badra. Oh, this is this is a very powerful verse. Maybe we can find it in the uh, it's in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, it's called Badra Abadra. That's how it starts. If you can, I'm not sure where it is in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I think it's in somewhere in Antialila. Badra Abadra. Maharaj, I'll have Rinda check into it right now, Maharaj. Okay. Uh, Sakale is another word. A Manda, A Bala, A Brahma, something like that. A is spelled E I, like that. If you hear that verse, then you'll understand everything. <laughs> it's Lord Chaitanya speaking this. He says, some people say this is good and other people say this is bad. Well, let's see. Dwayte Bhadra Bhadra Jana Sadhana Manodhan E Bala E Manda E Bala. In the material world, conceptions and good or bad are all mental speculation. Therefore, saying this is good and this is bad is all a mistake. It's because, for, as we were saying, some people say this is good and some people say this is bad, the same thing. For the flights that were blocked, it was bad, and for the snow, the snow slopes, it was good. <laughs> There's no absolute absolute bad and no absolute good in the material world. It's all relative to, you, to your consciousness. So if you're going to pray to the Lord in some way, you can say, my dear Lord, I'm struggling with this. Can you help me to understand how I can overcome this so I can become more of your devotee? Yes, Guru Maharaj, thank you very much. Actually, like that's normally my like prayer to Krishna, that please help me so I can overcome. I know like this is my karma, this is like your lila. Like I'm just going through uh, my karma, but help me so I can overcome. So thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think okay. it has cl clarified completely now in my mind. So thank you very, very much. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, um, uh... I'm sorry, I'll be right back. I got to do something here. I got this offering I have to take off the altar. That's fine, Marge. We can wait. Yeah, be quick. Mataji, may I add something to that? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Hare Krishna, all devotees. Please accept my humble obeisances. This is Manisha Mataji from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, for the last question that was being discussed, I have one small example, if you don't mind is that um, when uh, uh, someone like, uh, for example, if you take how like the gopis and Radharani, they love Krishna, right? At that level. So in, in this material world, if you can think in your lives or you heard some stories or something, like uh, when someone has the deepest uh, level of love for someone, so say there is a lady, right or say there's a man okay and he's in love with a woman right and he's so deeply and madly in love with that woman that no matter what that woman does if she is nice to him or if she is cruel to him or says some harsh words to him he's still just so madly in love with her that he loves everything that she does like uh, whether it's good or bad in the same way like a mother loves a child right so if the child is naughty and uh, you know hits the mother like a very small baby like uh, slaps the mother on the face or something the mother does not mind and maybe even a mother might say oh my child is so cute you know like uh, slapping me with his small little hands 
So in the same way, when you come to that uh, level of love for Krishna, then you start thinking, oh, Krishna, I love you, I love you, I love you. Like, no matter what you do with me, if you treat me harshly or you treat me kindly, whether you give me good things or bad things, I love you, I love you, I love you. So when you come to that level of love, then no matter what your lover does to you, you will love it. Whether your lover, your lover you know, uh, gives you attention, whether your lover ignores you, whether your lover, you know, gives you what you want, whether, you know, he doesn't give you what you want. So just try to think of that next time you're dealing with something harsh. I know it's very hard at the material level. It's, it's very easy to say, but extremely hard. But I hope this helps in the example that, um, you know, when you're dealing with somebody that, uh, or some situation, then you think that this is, my lover, uh, Krishna, giving uh, this to me. So uh, anything good or bad that you get, you will think of it as a gift from the Lord and uh, you will take it as his kindness. And so when you think of it in a, in a loving way, then no matter what it is, good or bad or neutral or whatever, then you'll feel like, oh, you know, this is the most wonderful, precious gift any attention, whether good or bad Krishna is giving, you will be so thankful and grateful for it. So my uh, pranam to all devotees again, and I hope it helps uh, someone. Hare Krishna. Nice thoughts. Nice, uh, nice thoughts and nice reflection, Manisha. Thank you. We, um, yeah, yeah, good points. Just reflecting more on your points that you shared. Um, we are still waiting for Maharaj to uh, come back, but if there are devotees that would like to, you know, share their thoughts on this, you know, please do so. Just use this time to wait. Maharaj is here, so we're good. <laughs> I'm back. Okay, so yeah, that was wise words. Thank you very much. It reminds me of the verse in the Shikshastika Malishyava Penaratam Punastava. Praise. Of course, this prayer is in the mood of Radharani's love for Krishna. And it's really a very elevated statement, but it actually, to adopt that mood is not so easy. But if we can, then everything becomes... Everything becomes wonderful if we can adopt that mood. Marge, there's one question from, uh, I'm going up here, Vishaka. She said, Hare Krishna, Marge, Krishna, Sama, humble obeisances, all glories to Shiro Prabhupada and all glories to you. What is the difference between Gyan and Vigyan? I have read instances where Vigyan is almost the same definition as Gyan. Is Vigyan synonymous for Gyan in some cases? Uh, it can be, but mostly there is a distinction given in definition. As Prabhupada said, Vigyan, the VI is short for Vishesha, or, um, which means intensification. So, Gyan is knowledge, Vigyan is intensification of knowledge, and as it's described, that intensification of knowledge is the difference between realization and theoretical understanding. Uh, sometimes we also say the difference between knowledge and wisdom. So there are distinctions made but Vigyan is, is actually more on the level of the practice of, or the, the results of Krishna consciousness, where Gyan is on the level of the practice of Krishna consciousness. So just like we, when we begin our Krishna consciousness, we're going through our stages of sadhana bhakti, we have a, a theoretical knowledge of the glories of the holy name. But as we progress and move forward 
to the higher stages of Krishna consciousness through purification of the heart, and then that realization turns into understanding the glories of the holy name by the experience of, the, of chanting. So, yeah, there is a distinction, but sometimes in the terminologies that are used, uh, they don't make much of a distinction, but there is. We're looking for vigyan. Vigyan is actually realization where gyan leads to realization. Thank you, Marsh. There's one question in the chat, and after that, I'll, I'll go to Sudevi. In the chat from Namrata, she says, Pranam Maharaj, I am attending your full lecture after many days and I'm very happy about it. I just wanted to request if you can elaborate more about dualities. You said, um, as you said, there's nothing like good or bad for Krishna. Then why do we always keep running around in these dualities? <laughs> yeah, that's, Krishna's wondering why we do that too. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to wake you up. Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Golda Chandra Bole, Kota Nidra Jaya Maya Pisa Chia Kole. Well, he he understands why we're doing it, but he's trying to get us out of it. <laughs> this is the this is the characteristics of the material world. Everything has its opposites. There's not, nothing absolute in anything material. Wherever there's bad, there's good. Wherever there's cold, there's, there's heat. I mean, wherever there's heat, there's cold. Wherever there is love, there is hate. Wherever there is cheating, there is honesty. And so everything has its duality. That's the material world. The fact is Krishna consciousness means to rise above these dualities. As Krishna says, be situated in transcendence. Rise above the dualities. Be free from all dualities and all, what is it he says? Uh, what is that verse? Trividya? No, Trividya. Triveda. Narakasya Dam Vidwara Nam Rasnati. Tri Vidya. Uh, it's in the Bhagavad Gita. Tri Vidya. Uh, the, the Vedas deal mostly with the three modes of material nature. Rise above these modes, are Arjuna, be transcendental, be, be free from moral anxieties and all dualities for gain and safety. Try Vedya, Tai Vidi, Vedi Vedi Kaste, Try, Try something. <laughs> it's, uh, I can give you the verse, it's 244 in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. I'll have uh, Rinda pull it up for you, Maharaj. 244 in Bhagavad Gita. And there's other verses that Compliment that verse. Yeah, Sri Sri Devi that's just posted in the uh, group chat that's um, 11, 20, 27 to 28 and Srimad Bhagavatam and Srimad Bhagavatam 2, 3, 10. I guess compliments the verse that you mentioned. No, yeah. no, no. no, no. no? I'm oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'll explain in a minute. Okay, that's fine. I'm just waiting for... Uh, either Vrinda Vishaka to share the verse that Maharaj just mentioned. I just heard them saying, I'm taking care of it. 244. It's Krishna's instructions to Arjuna. Trigunya visaya veda nis trigunya bhavarjuna nir duando nitisat nir yogash. The Vedas deal many with the three modes of material nature. Or do become transcendental to these three modes, be free from all dualities and all anxieties for gain and safety and be established in the self. So the Vedas mostly deal with different characteristics of the modes of material nature. 
But of course, there is a part of the Vedas which, where you have to rise above these and be situated in transcendence. So this would our this is Krishna's encouragement to Arjun here. So dualities and anxieties come from being situated in the three modes. Anxiety is the characteristic of everything in the material world. Everyone's in anxiety all the time. <laughs> Mars, there is um, a question to Devi. I will ask her because she had her hand, hand raised and then I'll, go to, I'll come to you, Sri Devi. So Devi, Mataji, please go ahead. Uh, Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you. Very nice class. Uh, going back to the point of accepting whatever Krishna is giving and not asking Krishna for material things, this uh, verse came to mind, Tattinu Kampam Sushumakshamana Bhunjaha Ivatma Rikav Vipakam Ridvag Bhavupur Vidhira Namaste Jiveta Yamukti Pade Sadaya Bhag. I was wondering if you can please uh, elaborate on that. Thank you. Wow, that's a class in itself, that whole verse. It's, <laughs> it's quite uh, big in its well the I uh, Prabhupada emphasized that we we learned this verse along with chanting the holy names of the Lord and it means that the devotee is practicing Krishna consciousness but runs into some suffering and that suffering is not so much coming from the external energy but it's coming from krishna himself directly to purify that devotee from some material attachment or to cause that devotee to become more surrendered in their devotional service so when the devotee recognizes that this is coming from krishna he prays to the lord thank you very much i actually deserve worse than this but because you are so merciful and so kind, you're giving me only a small portion of what I actually deserve. Therefore, he prays within the heart and he thanks the Lord. And then Mukti Padesha Dayabak means that um, the kingdom of God, and Prabhupada uses the analogy that if a child has very rich parents and... Um, the child is a good child, then the, whatever the riches are there, when the parents depart, it goes to the children. They don't have to do anything. All they have to do is stay in the family. So Prabhupada said, all we have to do is pray like this and stay in Krishna consciousness. And then the kingdom of God becomes automatically achieved. So, yeah. It's very hard for devotees to see the different difficulties that Krishna throws at you. He's doing it to correct you. He's doing it to purify you. So in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that the Lord is the permitter and overseer. Anumantam, uh, anu, anumantam, and also what is the other word? Uh, permitter and overseer. He allows things to happen to us so we can learn and move forward and become free from our wrong conceptions and our attachments. As Prabhupada said, we shouldn't be so concerned about the dualities that come in this material world if we just stay fixed in our Krishna consciousness. We see sometimes people work very hard <clears throat> to bring happiness and push away the suffering. And we all have that tendency, <clears throat> some of us more than others, but because it's natural to want to be free from suffering, it's natural to want to feel happier, feel some peace and some pleasure. But if we stay fixed in our devotional service, then Krishna will guide you in such a way that you will be free from the effects of these changes of the dualities of the material. And of course, 
if Krishna sends something directly, then the devotee is actually grateful and therefore thanks the devotee and thanks the Lord and wants to reciprocate by doing more devotional service. So we have to practice. I would suggest those of you who are interested, read that purport. Purport is very nicely explains the different dynamics of the verse. But it's a very important verse is spoken by Lord Brahma himself. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, Sri Devi, do you want to ask your question? Well, I was actually going to uh, add my little bit to what Vivek Prabhu was saying, if I may. Please, go ahead. Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances and all the Vaishnavas are offer my humble obeisances. All glories to Prabhupada, all glories to Gurudev and the Vaishnavas. I was thinking about what Vivek Prabhu said and uh, how Krishna encourages, you know, we may, not we may, we do have many material afflictions, desires, attachments, and so on. But the famous verse is there, Kama Karma, Akama Sarva Kamova, Moksha Kama Udharati, Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, Yajeta Purusham Param. Even if one is full of material desires, even if one has no material desires, or one wants liberation, with all one's uh, strength, one must simply worship the Lord. And the Lord will cleanse the devotee of all these, you know, material afflictions. That was one thing that came to mind. And the second one was this beautiful verse from the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where, you know, the devotee is disgusted. He knows that all sense gratification leads to misery, but still he's unable to help himself. That's just, you know, the strong conditioning. And there also Krishna is saying, just continue to worship me and I will free you from all these attachments. So there's so much great hope for us by Krishna's mercy, because we all may not be at that exalted level of uh, the last verse of Shikshashtakam, you know. We are not, at least personally speaking, I'm not there yet, but there is great hope. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, the problem Thank is... Thank you, Sri Devi. Nice points. The problem is we're not patient. We want instant Krishna consciousness. <laughs> but make your, as I said, make a sankalpa. Sankalpa means a vow, a determined vow, to fulfill a particular spiritual desires. I'm going to chant purely. And then you do everything... You can to achieve that goal. I'm going to develop love of God, and you do everything like that. I'm going to read every day Srimad Bhagavatam and learn many of the points that I read. So we have to have determined focus in our Krishna consciousness and not just go through the emotions of performing the activities. That's the difference between success and just uh, vacillating in the process. Thank you. Go ahead, Marge, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's it. Um, questions from other devotees? I'm just um, making sure. Hare that... Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisance to Shri Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, could you, just, uh, could you just speak more on the Paratattva and the differences differences between Paramama and Bhagavan? Uh, <clears throat> Jiva Goswami extensively discusses that in his Sandarvas, especially in Paramatma Sandarva. <clears throat> in uh, Bhakti Sandarva, he does also. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> well, we can add the third one, which is Brahman. The three features of the realizations of the absolute truth are more or less focused on by three types of persons also, four types of persons. The Brahman is sought after by the jnanis, Paramam is sought after by the yogis, and the Bhagavan realization is sought after by the devotees or the Vaishnavas. 
uh, the Lord manifests himself <clears throat> in this world as the indwelling super soul within the hearts of all living entity. He accompanies all living entities as their internal guide. <clears throat> and that is Paramatma. Paramatma is considered to be the witness of all of our activities. So that's uh, sometimes we, we want to understand how does God know everything? Well, he's situated in your heart. <laughs> He's right there with you every moment. And he's just watching. He's also giving guidance. But the guidance that he gives as Paramatma is understood clearly from the external, his external representative, the spiritual master. So the spiritual master <clears throat> is labeled as the external manifestation of the super soul. Or Paramatma, where he is saying exactly what Paramatma is saying within the heart. When one makes progress in devotional service and comes to the spontaneous platform of devotional service, Raghunuga Bhakti, then one can hear Paramatma directly and take guidance from Paramatma directly within the heart. So that's that's more of an advanced stage. <clears throat> <clears throat> so the Lord is there. He's fully uh, merciful by agreeing to accompany the living entity, even in the most abominable species of life. Even in a worm inside of stool, the Lord is there in the heart of that worm. Of course, the Lord never touches the material energy, so he's not uh, affected by any material condition. But at the same time, he agrees to accompany that soul wherever the soul is. Mm -hmm. And to realize Paramatma is the, uh, the yogis. The yogis want to realize God within the heart. He's situated everywhere. In the 14th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, it says everywhere his, his eyes and faces, his hands, he sees everything and therefore the super soul exists. I think it's four, 13th or 14th chapter, might be 13th chapter. <clears throat> Thank so, you, Marge. Yeah. Go ahead, Marge, I'm sorry. Yeah, I didn't finish. The complete realization is Bhagavan realization, which is Krishna in his transcendental form or any of the manifestations of Krishna in his form, such as Sri Ram, Lord Vishringadev, Lord Chaitanya. When we realize the Lord in his transcendental form as, par, as, as a person in devotional service, that is the goal of the devotees. So the devotees serve the Lord in, that, in the mood to realize the Lord in that form. So, Marge, can uh, can we can um, uh, can we say that you know from the from the Brahman realization to the Paramatma realization to the Bhagavan is it's a step step by step process, Marge? It can be. <clears throat> Actually, those who go that way when they get to Bhagavan realization are really fixed. We didn't we didn't ever as devotees we never really went through the first two stages. We went right to Bhagavan. <laughs> Because that's what Prabhupada gave us, Bhagavan realization. Although he explained everything in relationship to the other levels of realization, still he was teaching us the process of Bhagavan realization. So sometimes we might find, because if you go step by step, although it's harder when you reach the high, when you reach Bhagavan realization, you're fixed. But we can be fixed in, uh, in Krishna consciousness because Lord Chaitanya has made it easy through the chanting of the Holy Name. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maharaj. 
Well, we are. We also are fortunate not having to go have to go through all those lower stages either, because <laughs> you could get stuck in those stages too, <laughs> mm. and that's what usually happens. <clears throat> We get comfortable. Well, there's some happy, there's happiness on all those levels. Uh, yeah. But only on the Bhagavan stage is there pure love. On the Brahman stage, there's no pure love. Oh. On the Paramatma stage, love is slightly awakened. But on the Bhagavan stage is complete. Thank you, Maharaj. Are there any other questions or comments, uh, re reflections, realizations? Maharaj, I would like to ask a question, Maharaj, on the verse that we were initially speaking about and um, in, uh, talking about the, the entity having, having an eternal spiritual form, but while they're in the material world, there's so many bombardment and, uh, you know, and material contamination. And as we are entering into the year, you know, we've had rough times then going to 2021. It's sometimes, Marge, it's, it's, it's difficult to want to accept change. You know, um, they know that something has, you know, something has to change. They expect the external to change for them as opposed to the internal. So as devotees, Marge, how can we really... Um, uh, introspectively uh, be willing to want to change for the better in terms of Krishna consciousness? Well, you, you answered it. <laughs> <laughs> Your question had the answer right in it. <laughs> introspective. <laughs> by, by becoming introspective and seeing where we are and where we need to go to, then we can also, also chalk out the process of getting there. We have to take inventory. Where are we? I think Bhakti Tirta Swami was very good at using that terminology, taking inventory to see where you are and see what you need to do to move forward. What are some of my, you know, blocks? What are some of my attachments? What are some of the things that are that are also good, but that could be expanded into something even more? So work on relationships with other devotees, work on the quality of your chanting, work on reading and studying more of Prabhupada's books. And take a, take a little inventory of your day and see what the things is that you don't really need to do. <laughs> Get rid of those things. <laughs> I mean, some of that, sometimes we have this idiosyncrasies. We like these little things in our life that we just like to do. They have no meaning. <laughs> they just are there maybe because we like them. That's all. <clears throat> uh, let me I had another point I was going to make yeah <clears throat> there's, a, there's four things you can sit down with a piece of paper and pencil and you write four categories down so are you ready? yes Marge okay you're, the first category is essential Sure. Second category is important. Yeah. important. Important. Third category is not, not essential. Non essential. Not essential. And the last category is not important. So put all your activities in one of those four categories. Thank you, Maharaj. <laughs> it's good homework for us today. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. I was reading, and I'm sorry, Maharaj, please go ahead. 
the last category, don't fill it up too much. <laughs> I was reading a nice article yesterday by Mahatma Prabhu about uh, change, and he was saying that um, um, in, in order to change, we have to freak out. Like, like something major in our life has to freak us out before we do something to change. And either it can be good or it can be too late. So, and he was saying how we have to really do, yeah, like what you mentioned, you like to really look in and why wait for it to freak out, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's the default method. I don't know how good that would be in some cases. Sometimes when, the thing, when you freak out, then you may grab for the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, what he's saying has some value in the sense that, well, we're so stubborn mm -hmm. that, it, that it takes a little bit of an explosion before we change. Yes, Mars. That's exactly what he was saying, uh, you know, that he said that we always have to be forced and that's not necessary. That's what he was actually trying to say. Why wait for the explosion? Yeah. Yeah. It'll come if you keep going the way you're going. <laughs> <laughs> not you, I mean, in general, I'm saying. <laughs> I understand, Mars. It happens to me too. Yes. Yes. Are there any other questions or comments from devotees? Um, any topics, you know, this is such a nice um, uh, Sangha that we're having here. Um, just want to make sure that I, I don't miss anyone from any other comments or questions, uh, realizations. Yes, Pratchett has a question. Um, Maharaj, can you, uh, it's not a question, but uh, speak a little more on the need to prioritize the spiritual over the material. The need to prioritize it. Sometimes the material is a necessary thing. But we always get the sense that the spiritual is always important. So if you come first, at least I think that way. So. Well, practically, you want a practical answer to that, right? That would help. Well, you have to have time within your day for both. So therefore, then organizing, scheduling it. So you, you can make your spiritual life around your material needs, or you can make your material needs around your spiritual life. Depends on which way you're going to go. <laughs> so we put one of the two or four. So people have this tendency to think, and this is a good question you brought up, good point, that uh, the spiritual can be adjusted, but the material I can't adjust that that has to happen. So with that with that mindset, then we have a tendency to subliminate or uh, relegate spirituality to a lesser level of importance. Although we may accept it as being important, it's lesser. But, but to get over that is just to schedule both. And the beginning of the day and the end of the day should end with something spiritual. The beginning of the day should be sadhana. The end of the day should be sadhana. Thank you, Mark. And on a higher level, you can um, those who are expert in and in activities, they can amalgamate both into one, where they spiritualize all their material activities. That is high level, Maharaj. <laughs> We're doing that to some degree. Mm. Sri Devi has a question. Sri Devi, go ahead. Uh, Guru Maharaj, on this question that Parikshit Prabhu raises about balancing the material and spiritual, uh, there are many people in our family who are non-devotees 
and when we are trying to step up our spiritual activities they implore us please be balanced please don't go overboard you're becoming so fanatical you're so dogmatic you're going crazy you're this you're that and you know why can't you be balanced like other people and so you know i'm just wondering if you could help us to understand how to balance things in such a way that we are not becoming fanatical yeah we are fanatical <laughs> <laughs> we're fanatical for krishna <laughs> It's just a matter of consciousness. It's uh, the activities are the same. If, try, if you're trying to beat somebody over the head with your spirituality, then you're going to look like that. Just schedule your life in such a way that you can uh, organize your responsibilities but and organize your spiritual practice. The first thing we do when we get up is that we offer obeisances, we prepare ourselves and we chant japa, we read, we attend some spiritual function and we take Krishna Prashad. And then the day begins. So after breakfast, we can go on with our material responsibilities and try to do that in the right consciousness as an offering to Krishna. Well, you can't sacrifice one part of your day <laughs> just to, you know, increase your uh, the time you have for uh, material activities you should leave that foundation there the foundation to our everything we do is our our sadhana so yeah that's why krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that we we should regulate our life life should be regulated Or we could strive for regulation. But I can tell you an easy thing. I was just reading some of the notes that I had written in my diary. This is the notes that you transcribed for me. I've been going through those transcriptions and doing the adjustments. And it was just the one, the one you did for the year 2014. <clears throat> and it says that, you know, we should be... <clears throat> It says regulation. We should be we should be striving for regulation. And I wrote down after striving for regulation for many years, I'm still striving for regulation. But then again, I added, but I do have one regulation. Try to remember Krishna amongst all the activities we perform and be regulated in trying to remember Krishna always. And then you're regulated. Because I was traveling, and traveling means no regulation. Traveling means you're sit you go by the situation that confronts you, and you have to adjust all the time. <clears throat> so <clears throat> trying to find regulation in that was impossible. But <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, trying to remember Krishna always made everything wonderful, made it all easier and more natural. As soon as you forget Krishna, everything is just a mess. <laughs> yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much for reminding us. Thank you very much. As soon as we forget Krishna, we're subjected to our crazy mind. Mars, there's a question um, from Facebook from Rohini where she asks, um, Hare Krishna Maharaj, in India, the Brahmin caste oppresses the other caste. 
In the West, there is no caste system, but we still differentiate between devotees and non-devotees. Is this still the same separating mentality? Uh, there is. There has to be that differentiation for the sake of association, for the sake of, uh, uh, yeah, as it's mentioned, we, were, we gave a class just a couple of days ago. One should relate to people on different levels according to their situation. So differentiation is not a form of exploitation. It's a form of way to communicate with different levels of people. Lord Chaitanya wouldn't speak, uh, you know, intimate pastimes with devotees in general, but with his confidential devotees, he did. So he discriminated. And for the people in general, he never mentioned Krishna's pastimes. He always talked about the philosophy. So we have to make a differentiation based on developing a relationship. That's there. If it's done in order to gain something materially, then that's exploitive. Like the example Rohini gives where the Brahmins are oppressing the other, other classes. But it's not about oppression, it's about relationships. It's not about exploitation, it's about uh, developing proper communications. How can you communicate with everybody on the same level? You have to make a differentiation. Just like in the, uh, let's see, if I can remember that. Uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let me, what, I think it's first canto, chapter 11, verse 22. I think that's the verse. I might be wrong. One is, uh, Vishaka, want to go for that one? 111.22, I think. I think they're on a roll for that. Uh, I hope that's the verse. Let me see. Translation. Yeah, here it is. Okay. The Almighty Lord greeted everyone present by bowing his head, exchanging greetings, embracing, shaking hands, looking, smiling, giving assurances and warning of benedictions, even to the lowest in rank. So here you'll see eight different ways that the Lord related to eight different classes of people. Some he offered obeisances, mm. some he offered, he exchanged greetings, some he embraced, some he shook hands with, some he looked at and smiled, others he awarded benedictions. So the Lord also made distinctions between the different types of people when he came in contact with them. Again, the purport might also elaborate on that. Vishaka, can you go down to the purport? Keep going down. Keep going down. There we go. Everyone Maharaj, was... do you want me to read the purport, Maharaj? Yeah. Okay. To, to receive Lord Sri Krishna, there were all grades of population from Vasudev, Ugrasen, and Gargamuni, the father, grandfather, and teacher, down to the prostitutes and chandalas who are accustomed to eat dogs. And every one of them was properly greeted by the Lord in terms of rank and position. As pure living entities, all are the separated parts and process of the Lord, and thus no one is alien by his eternal relation. Such pure living entities are graded differently in terms of contamination of the most of the material nature, but the Lord is equally affectionate to all his parts and parcels, despite material gradation. 
he descends only to recall these materialistic living beings back to his kingdom and intelligent persons take advantage of this facility offered by the personality of Godhead to all living beings. No one is rejected by the Lord from the kingdom of God and he remains, sorry, and it remains with the living being to accept this or not. Yeah, so he, he, he greets people according to their different degradations. So devotees should be the same way. We relate to people accordingly. But everyone, but the, what is the principle? Respect. That's the principle of relationship, to give everyone respect in relationship to the type of uh, situation we find ourselves in. In other words, <clears throat> you don't relate to children the same as you do to your friend next door or to your wife or to your husband. Everyone may have a loving relationship or respectful relationship with different kinds of people, but how that's played out is different. <clears throat> The Lord showed by his example. <laughs> Wonderful verse is one of my favorite verses. Thank you, you Mark. It's a very yeah, powerful yeah. verse. Yeah. <coughs> a very nice question by Rohini, too. Thank you for asking that question, Rohini. Really nice. I, I hope that answered her question. <laughs> Um, yeah, it came from Facebook, so I'm going to wait to see um, Vrinda when she checks her response on Facebook, but yeah. Thank you, Marge. Are there any other questions or comments from the devotees and our realizations, anything? Uh, please uh, do unmute. Um, we have taken quite a bit of Marge's time. Mar I meant to ask you early in the call. We heard about the earthquake march. How are you and all the devotees doing? Um, I was in Slovenia okay. and uh, I felt the shaking here. A couple pictures fell, a couple vases fell. I'm 120 miles away okay. from, the, from the heart of the earthquake. That earthquake was 6.4 on the Richter scale. It was big. Since then, I just got a message here. There were more than 80 quakes in the area in the last 60 hours. So these are smaller quakes. Some were strong and some were a weak tremble, but we felt most of them. According to the charts, Mother Booming seems to be moving westward and inward closer to Zagreb for the beginning, and I have this impression, the worst is yes to, yet to come. Uh, yeah, and uh, we, we, we contacted one of our mystics in Slovenia, and she says, yeah, it's going to keep, continue to come, these quakes in this area. And so that, that uh, city that it hit directly, which is called Petrina, um, I mean, uh, they're still, counting the bodies, but the last count was eight, and uh, many people were injured. The mayor of the city said his whole city is destroyed. He needs, he's calling for help for rebuilding the city. But I was 120 miles away, and I was thinking, what is this? Because we're not situated on any kind of earthquake fault where we are. So there's an alarm out. People are apprehensive, uh, anxious, because they don't know when it's going to happen again. But like I read, there has been 80 quakes in the last 60 hours, and some of them are just tremors, and some of them are a little bit bigger. 2.4, 1.1, like that. Shakes. Because once the big one comes, the smaller ones follow for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and it doesn't make life peaceful <laughs> because even though you know the smaller ones, you can somehow, you know, tolerate when they come, you're always in anxiety about, well, <laughs> you know, I might be in the shower and there's the next one's gonna come and <laughs> 
what do I do, you know? <laughs> so yeah, there is Yeah, some... that is anxiety. Wow. Yeah, there's one devotee, he, he, him and his wife are going to move out of the area and go to another. In fact, a lot of devotees are actually moving out of that area to go into other areas to live with other devotees. There's, there's a, there's, I know, at least I know two or three that are actually doing that. They're moving out of their house and just going to live with other devotees mm. that are from the, the main center. Mm. When in March, when I was in Croatia, I was in my house and the earthquake came. This was this was a, a big one, 5.6. My pictures kept flying off the wall, glasses were smashed. And I was chanting Japa, it was in the morning time and uh, take the light side of it, I thought, what is this? I'm not trying to dance, but I'm dancing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was bouncing around the floor there for a while. And then my friend downstairs, my disciple, who I was staying with, he said, Maharaj, let's get out. <laughs> so we jumped into the car and we drove to a safe area. And uh, so, yeah, so the Part of the wall cracked in the house, and many of my pictures were, the glasses were destroyed, and the pictures were okay, but, so yeah, we were subjected to that in March, and then now again, a bigger one, which is bigger than the one that it was. So Croatia seems to have these places that are situated on earthquake faults. California, especially in the San Francisco area, is situated right on an earthquake fault. And so Mother, Mother Earth is a little disturbed with the sinful activities of the living entities. And she takes, she takes, uh, she punishes the living entities in different ways by their sinful activities. Prabhupada describes how Mother Nature works. She is the rewarder and the chastiser. Seeing her children acting wrongly and sinfully, she punishes them. Seeing them acting properly, worshiping the Father, acting piously, she rewards them. She's a supplier and she's the punisher. But under uh oh, she works under the control of the Lord, of course. But the Lord also gives her, you know, that feature to act according to how the sinful activities or the pious activities are being there. He's like a watchmaker who makes a watch and then sets the watch going and then the watch works. But anytime he can change how the watch works. <laughs> but... That's how material energy works. So this is a whole different discussion, but this is how material energy works. So we shouldn't be surprised as long as people can continue to, can continue to commit sinful activities. And we're talking about heavy sinful activities, such as you know, slaughterhouses, killing innocent animals, Abortions, killing, killing unborn children. These kinds of sinful activities have tremendous material, uh, what we say, sufferings attached to them. And when it becomes full blown, then the whole area becomes affected by it. It's just like the example in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. I think maybe it's better in the Chaitanya Bhagavat. When um, Ramachandra Khan, he was the one who offended 
Srila Hari Das Thakur by sending the prostitute. So after that incident happened, he was in his home. Was, he had somewhat of a, an estate. So Lord Nityananda came to visit. And the associates of Lord Nityananda announced to Ramchandra Khan that Lord Nityananda has come. Can you make arrangements for his stay? Ramachandra Khan told the assistants and the Lord Nityananda, well, Lord Nityananda can stay in the, in the cow barn. <laughs> in other words, he didn't give him any residence. He just said, you can stay in the barn. <laughs> when Lord Nityananda heard what Ramachandra Khan said, he laughed. But his laughter was mixed with his anger. He the There's about two or three incidents where the Lord laughed in anger. This is one of them. So when he did that, he just laughed and he took his disciples and they immediately left the place. Just after that, the leading political, the, I guess he was the, the uh, Kazi, came and he came to the place of Ramachandra Khan. He killed the cow there and then he, he plundered all the uh, possessions of Ramachandra Khan and he destroyed the village all around it. So because of his offense first to Haridas and then to, the, to Lord Nityananda, Ramachandra Khan got a heavy reaction. But because he was situated in a certain area, the people around him, they also suffered because of his sinful activities. So when sinful activities really become strong, everyone feels the effect, even if you're not directly involved. You may not suffer, but you'll be put into inconveniences, just like what's happening now. The devotees are inconvenienced by what's happening, but they don't suffer. So, and that's how sinful activities work in such a way as they expand themselves out. When I was traveling in India, I went to south, I went to one area in the south, and I was at the Adi Keshava temple. This is the temple where Lord Chaitanya came. And he found the Brahma Samhita, the prayers. When he found them, he copied them and took them back to his devotees and said, these are the best of all prayers. And he showed them to his devotee. He was really happy to find them. So I was in that temple. We were there. We were also chanting every day the Brahma Samhita prayers along with the temple, you know, residents. And then I met one priest there and he was telling me not too long ago maybe about 10 years ago one of the priests who was tending to the deity there he starts stealing the deity's jewelry and therefore and he was going on for some time and then finally was found out that he had stole it and then he disappeared. He had to hide. And so he was living on, in this village right near the temple. That whole village became desolate. They lost all their, all their crops. It was like, in other words, everyone in the village had to suffer because of this one person who exploited his position by stealing jewelry from the deities. That's a heavy offense, <laughs> stealing directly from the Lord. <laughs> so it works like that, that sometimes others who are not directly involved in the situation may have to undergo some difficulty just because they're in that area. <laughs> Marsh, does the difficulty continues even after the offense, you know, the person that committed the sinful act 
um, you know, confesses, apologizes or whatever. Does it continue? Does it stop? Does it, you know? It's a matter of time. It gradually decreases and eventually it's, it's over. But it may not happen immediately because the reactions span out over a period of time. That's generally how, how material energy works. Just like, you know, I was in that house in March and, you know, I was in convenience. A lot of the things that I had got smashed and I had to get out of there and we had to. So we were inconvenienced. We lost some property and like that. We had nothing to do with the situation, but because we were in that area, we were victimized by the earthquake. Uh, mostly material turbulences are caused by uh, material, by sinful activities, such as droughts, famines, pestilence. Pestilence, this coronavirus is directly related to that. And if there anybody doubts that, all they have to do is go to Srimad Bhagavatam, seventh canto, 15th chapter, Verse number 24, if you want to bring that one up, 7, 15, 24. It's an interesting verse because it helps us to understand what's happening now. It's more the purport than the verse, but the verse leads into the purport. thing that goes are trying to pull it up now Marge. <clears throat> yeah okay mm -hmm. translation want to read uh, Anasuya? <laughs> yes Marge by good behavior and freedom from envy one should counteract sufferings due to other living entities by meditation in trance, one should con counteract sufferings due to providence. And by practicing hatha yoga, pranayam, and so forth, one should counteract off sufferings due to the body and mind. Similarly, by developing the mode of goodness in regard to eating, one should conquer sleep. Okay, now, report. By meditation in trance, one should counteract sufferings due to progress, providence. That's what we're talking about. Okay, go ahead. Uh, in the purport, it says, by practice, one should avoid eating in such a way that other living entities will be disturbed and suffer. Since I suffer when pinched or killed by others, I should not attempt to pinch or kill any other living entity. People do not know that because of killing innocent animals, they themselves will have to suffer severe reactions from material nature. Any country where people indulge in unnecessary killing of animals will have to suffer from wars and pestilence imposed by material nature. Correct. It's right there. Shall, yeah. shall I continue, Marge, or shall I stop there? Yeah. Okay, if you like. Yeah. But that's okay. the, yeah, of course, there's another good point there. Comparing one's own suffering to the suffering of others, therefore, one should be kind to all living entities. One can avoid the sufferings inflicted by providence, and therefore, when suffering comes, one should fully absorb oneself in chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. One can avoid sufferings from the body and mind by practicing mystic hatha yoga. And so Prabhupada tells us what causes it, what is the reaction, and how to get out of it. Meditation, in, in, in other words, that meditation is... If we just continue to chant it, we will never be affected by this uh, coronavirus. And I give you an example. Um, this happened just recently. Uh, one young man who is writing our devotees, he's in jail, he's an inmate. He's writing one devotee who 
contacted me and told me this story. In fact, it wasn't an only a story, it was a letter written by the devotee. When he was in jail, he got coronavirus and he was suffering. And uh, the jailers, the administration, they did nothing. They wouldn't give him any medicine. They wouldn't give him anything. So having some understanding of Krishna consciousness, he just absorbed himself in chanting. And after some time, he freed himself from the virus. Without any medicine, only by his own endeavor. Yeah, I have the letter. Letter written by him himself. Because yeah. he had complete faith that by taking shelter of Krishna, Krishna would save me. And it happened. And he wasn't an even initiated devotee. He was just someone that we were writing to and preaching to. Yeah, it's amazing. You could you could read my lips much. I was saying amazing here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, it, when you say amazing, it's it's not amazing. You're saying amazing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, when I read that, I was just thinking, wow, the Holy, everybody should know this because it really shows the faith in the Lord and faith in chanting of the Lord's holy name. He had both. Mm -hmm. Amazing. The holy name of the Lord is powerful. Wow. Thank you so much, Maharaj. So much. Thank you. Um, are there so be our, I'm sorry, Maharaj. Go ahead. This verse should be circulated around so everyone knows. Yes. 7, uh, 7 15, 24. Yeah. Beautiful verse. Thank you so and much, Maharaj. Word. I don't know if the devotees have any questions. We have taken Marge's time two hours. I didn't even realize we're having such good time. We lose track of time, as they say, especially with spiritual sangha. Um, just to give devotees any last minute point, I don't want to you know, ignore anyone, although I know that we've gone way past Marge's time. Um, are there any last minute comments or questions, um, realizations, reflections? We are creeping up to the second hour. And if there isn't, wait, I just saw something popped up in the chat. What is it? We are in the spiritual world. <laughs> Thank you, Sri Devi. You're always boosting us with such nice positivity. I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> and I see another chat coming up, Dipti. Yes, thank you devotees for joining us on this call. We thank Marat so much for really giving us so much time this morning and we can really meditate on what Marja says as we enter into the new year and really ending with this such nice pastime that chanting of the holy name actually cured someone with COVID. It's just amazing and it, that, that is, you know, more and more um, uh, reflections for us to go deeper in our japa. And Marge, we wish you all the best as you are, you know, at that you are in Slovenia and we pray that no more small quakes, big quakes, any quakes come up for you there. Because <laughs> we really would like to see you next year, Marge, really, when this whole thing settles down. And we thank all the devotees. Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha. His Holiness Chandramali Swami Kija. Shil Prabhupad Kija. Thank you so much, devotees. And thank you again, Marge. And we wish you all a wonderful new year. And we looked and we look forward to, to seeing you next year. Just tomorrow. Oh, glory to your service. Thank you, Marge.